You can tell my voice is weak. Uh, we re did return yesterday um, at around one um, from Falls Creek after a great week. And um, so we survived. Thank you for all the prayers. Thank you for all the support back home. Uh, we had 14 salvations, new salvations during the week. And we had a couple other major decisions. We had 12 recommitments. And we had a one call to ministry and then some multiple baptisms that you'll see um, today. Uh, what I'd like to do, if you um, felt the call to be baptized and you're getting baptized today, so the four or five of y'all, if y'all want to come forward and just stand in the front real quick, and we can give them a round of applause and support and praise God for what they did in their lives. Y'all yeah, great, y'all great, yeah, that's great. So these four have come to be baptized. This is uh, the three Welch um, siblings. This is Ava on your left, my right, and then Carter, right, in the between them, and then Bailey, who is the oldest, who have come forward to be baptized. And this is Addison Bedford. Um, y'all know Addison, y'all know Greg and the Bedford family. If you would like to affirm um, their baptism today, would you raise your Bibles and say amen? Amen, amen. awesome. Let's give them a round of applause and give God praise. Uh, y'all can be seated. Y'all four can be seated. You're welcome to see them um, after the service uh, be baptized. And then in the weeks ahead, um, there'll be some more that you will see. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could care?
Almighty because he saved us. He brought us out of that grave from death to life. And it is only through Christ Jesus that we are saved.
all the hosts of heaven who else can make every king bow down who else can whisper in darkness tremble only a holy God what other beauty what other beauty Splendor outshines the sun. What other majesty rules with justice? Only a holy God. Come and behold him, the one and the only.
worship a holy God. Okay, so I'm going to baptize my brother. Um, Carter, here, grab your nose. Yep, and then turn this way. So I baptize you, my brother Carter, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, buried in Christ in baptism, raised and walked to in newness of life. So this is Bailey. In ministry, sometimes you have people be nice to you and like say, oh, that was fun, even though they weren't having fun or um, they just kind of lie to you and be a little bit fake to like help you encourage you. Well, Bailey's not that. She'll, she's always honest uh, for me. She'll, I, she's my litmus test, my standard to see if something is lame because she'll always tell me, no, that was lame. That was cringy. Don't do that again. And so I love Bailey's honesty. Uh, but Bailey was saved at Falls Creek um, and she um, immediately, yes, give her an applause. And uh, I'm so we're going to baptize Bailey now. Here. So I baptize you, Bailey, my sister, in Christ, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried in Christ in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. All right, this is her little sister, Ava. This is the middle, Welch. Um, and she has been coming to our student ministry um, since the, the fall of September of 2022. Uh, and so uh, it's a great pleasure of mine to uh, now baptize Ava. And so Ava, I baptize you, my sister in Christ, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, buried in Christ with baptism, raised to walk in the innocent life. This is Addison Bedford. Some of you um, grew up or uh, raised Brad um, and had him in uh, children's ministry and in student ministry. And this um, is his oldest daughter, Addison. So we'll baptize her now. Mm-hmm, not right here. <laughs> All right, I baptize you, Addison, in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, buried in Christ and baptism, raised to walk in the name of life. Today we give praise to God of what we have seen this summer in the lives of our children and our youth. Thank the Lord for Chase and Ariel for their leadership and uh, what a great week. When you hear the sponsor say that it was a good week, then we uh, give praise to the Lord uh, for everything that's occurred and what we will see in our service uh, a little bit later. If you have your Bibles, please open them up to 1 Samuel chapter 16, 1 Samuel chapter 16, and let's begin with a word of prayer together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for what you are doing in the midst of our church. We thank you what you're doing in the midst of your people, and we pray, Father, that today, that we would come today with hungry hearts to be able to hear a word from you. And Father, we pray that we would allow your word to speak to us and to grip our hearts and to respond to it. And we pray that, Father, that your word would go out and it would be glorified and have its end results in our lives. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. What we need to understand is, is that God looks at the world so different than a natural man looks at the world. You see, a natural man, he, he looks at the outside and makes judgments according to what he sees on the outside, but God looks at the world so differently. You see, God takes a probe and he pushes it down into the heart of a man, a woman, a student. And he looks at the motives, the intentions, the desires, the purposes of the heart. And that's how God makes his judgment. And God looks at the heart, not just simply at the external part of a man. God doesn't look at what the color of your skin is, who your mom or your dad is, and where you've come from, how much money you have in the bank. But God looks of the purity and the intentions of the heart. For we find that a man is interested in your charisma, but God is interested in your character. We find that man is interested in your aptitude, where God is interested in your attitude. We find that man 
is interested in your natural ability where God is interested in your supernatural ability. Today we're going to see in God's Word truly how God looks at a man, at a woman, at a student, that he truly looks at the heart of each individual. I ran across an interesting story given by Chip Heistad, and he told a story that was written about Jesus looking for his disciples. And Jesus goes to a firm to help him to choose the disciples, and they are to give feedback upon those that Jesus is going to have as his disciples. And we find this interesting story that is make-believe helps us understand how man looks differently upon a person than God does. The letter goes like this, and I quote, To Jesus, the son of Joseph and the woodcrafter shop in Nazareth, from the management consultants of Jerusalem, subject is staff aptitude evaluation. Dear Jesus, thank you for submitting the resume of the 12 men you have picked for your management positions in your new organization. All of them have now taken our battery of tests, and we have not only run the results through our computer, but also arranged personal interviews for each of them with our psychologists and our vocational aptitude consultants. It is the staff's opinion that most of your nominees are lacking in background, education, vocational aptitude for the type of enterprise that you're undertaking. They did not have the team concept. We recommend to you that you continue your search for persons of experience and managerial ability and proven capability. The letter goes on to say, Simon Peter, he's emotional, unstable, and given to fits of temper. Andrew absolutely has no qualities of leadership. The two brothers, James and John, the son of Zebedee, place their personal interests above the company's loyalty. Thomas demonstrates a questioning attitude that would tend to undermine the morale We feel that it's our duty to tell you that Matthew has been blacklisted by the Jerusalem Better Business Bureau. James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, definitely had radical leanings, and they both registered a high score on manic depressive scale. But one of the candidates, however, shows a great potential. He's a man of ability, resourcefulness, and he meets people well. He has a keen business mind and has contact in high places. He's highly motivated, ambitious, innovative. We recommend Judas Iscariot as your comptroller, as your right-hand man, end of quote. You see, God looks at the heart and not the outward person. As your Bibles are open to 1 Samuel 16, let's begin with verse 1 together. Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go, and I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have selected a king for myself among his sons." But Samuel said, how can I go? When Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I've I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. And you shall invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I'll show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me the one who I designate to you. Verse 4. So Samuel did what the Lord said, and he came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the city came trembling to meet him and said, Do you come in peace? And he said, In peace I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourself and come with me to the sacrifice. 
He also consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. Then it came about when he entered that he looked at Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or the height of his statue because I have rejected him. God sees not as a man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and, and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Next, Jesse made Shammah pass by. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Thus, Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen thee. And Samuel said to Jesse, all these, all the children? And he said, there remains yet the youngest. And behold, he is tending the sheep. Then Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. And we've just found that we have passed through 50, 350 years of the book of Judges. And now we've entered the time of the monarch period. They've selected the first king. His name was Saul. And we find that Saul was a big disappointment. He disappointed everyone. And particularly he disappointed Samuel, the prophet of God. He ruled his kingdom by his own nature, his own will. He's a very self-centered individual. He was scared of giving applause to anyone else and, and enjoying the applause of others. He, in a sense, he was schizophrenic, scared somebody was going to take his kingship or his loyalties away. And we find that this time, Samuel finds himself grieving over this situation, grieving over Saul, who had <clears throat> so much potential in his life. So much to give to the Lord, so much to help Israel do. But in a sense, he forfeited all that and let it go. And now we find the prophet of God is grieving. But God comes to him and says, how long are you going to do this grieving? Uh, the word in Hebrew is the word mourning. It, it literally means that he was like mourning over a dead person. Man, he, he was really emotionally spent, emotionally grieving over this situation, over the king. And God said, how long are you going to do it? How long are you going to continue this mode? Because I have already rejected him. He is not the man anymore to be king. I want you to go to Bethlehem, and I, I want you to anoint another from the family of Jesse. He will be the king. And we find that he says, Lord, how can I go? If I go to Bethlehem and say, I'm going to anoint a new king, you know about this guy that I've been grieving over. He's paranoid. He will kill me if I, if I go. And I love what God does. God comes up with a plan. God is saying really to Samuel, don't worry about it. I've got your back. I got you covered. You go and say that you're coming to town and you're going to give a sacrifice, which he does. But the real reason that he comes, he's coming to anoint a new king. I want you to notice verse 4. So Samuel did what the Lord said. And he came to Bethlehem and the elders of the city came trembling to meet him and said, Do you come in peace? We find that Samuel was faithful to God. Even though in the back of his mind he knew that it could cost his life, he was faithful to God. But notice the elders. You remember the elders stand at the gate. And they kind of watch and do their business, help the community there. The elders are coming in. They see, coming into the city of Bethlehem, they see Samuel. And notice the words. They're trembling. They're trembling. We find that Samuel now has the reputation of like walking tall. 
he carries a big stick with him. You remember just one chapter over that you read this week what he did to King Agat. He chopped him in pieces. And now they're saying, oh, man, is he coming to do his business? Is he coming to, to chop us off? Is he coming to, to really make judgment upon us? And so the leaders come and they're trembling and, and they want to know, have you come in peace? Remember at Southwestern, there's a story that went around about a Texas evangelist in kind of the early day. He was a tent evangelist and he would set up his tent in communities and he would have his bird dogs there and he would hunt and, and go coon hunting and different things after the revival. But one day, they said in the revival, there were two drunk men that were back in the back that were hollering and yelling, mocking, making fun of the evangelists as they were trying to conduct a service. The evangelist asked everyone if they would just bow their heads and pray. They said he got off the platform of this tent revival and went back to the back, greeted those two men, beat them up as they were in the back, brought them back forcefully, put them on the front row and told them to listen to the rest of the service. Man, that is an evangelist, amen? And uh, so we find, that, we find that Samuel had that reputation. Man, he was the Chuck Norris of his time. He, he was the Billy Bad Guy of his day. He was the rock in the sense. And so he says, no, listen. He said, I come in peace. Notice verse 5. He said to them, in peace I come to you. Sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourself and come with me. He's talking to the elders to make a sacrifice. He also consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. The word consecrate literally means to prepare yourself, to present yourself to the Lord. If it's a serious thing that when we come into a place of worship, when we come before the Lord, we in a sense need to consecrate ourselves. We need to prepare ourselves that we are meeting the Lord. You remember 1 Corinthians chapter 11 as they were taking the Lord's Supper. They were doing it in a whimsical sense. And Paul writes to them and he said, many of you are sick. Many of you have died. Because in a sense you haven't consecrated yourself to, to take the Lord's Supper. And so he says to them, we need to consecrate ourselves. And then we will sacrifice to the Lord. And I'm sure in that meeting with the elders and Jesse and his sons there, the word began to get out, and there had to be an air of excitement that this is more than just a regular worship service and a sacrifice to the Lord, that they're going to be a new king. A new king is going to be anointed. Who is that going to be? And that excitement was in the air. And we find that Samuel begins to look at Jesse's sons. And he begins to look him up and down. And he calls the first one out, Eliab. And he said, come. And he looks him over and he had the appearance of a king. You remember Saul was shoulder and head above everybody else. And we find that Eliab was the oldest, but he was tall in stature as well. And so he had to be the one. He had to be the one that he was going to anoint and, and be the new king. And, and God says, not this one. And we find that Samuel made the mistake that so many of us make the mistake that we look at the outward appearance of a person only. But God doesn't look at the outward appearance of a person only. God looks at the heart. He looks at the motives of why somebody's doing it. He looks at the purity of the heart of of a person that is doing the activity. I want you to notice verse 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or the height of his stature. He must have been a taller person. Because I've rejected him. For God sees not as a man sees. For a man looks at the outward appearance. But the Lord looks at the heart. Samuel made the mistake. He looked at the outward appearance and said, this guy looks to be fit as a king. Look at verse 7 again, the last part. For God sees not as a man sees. 
For a man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And this is really the key passage. The key passage to this section of saying, look, God looks at the heart. He looks at the motives, the purity, why somebody is doing it. And then Jesse says, hey, I've got six other sons. And he begins to parade every son before Samuel. And each time God says, no, 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 none of these. And then Samuel says, is there another? And Jesse says, oh, yeah, I've, I've got another one, the youngest son. Now, I want you to hear this. In the Hebrew, the word means small. It can be translated to mean young. It also can be translated to be unimportant. Could Jesse be saying, yeah, I've got one more son, but he's not impressive. He, he's not the guy. He's out tending the sheep. He's not the one that you're looking for. He's young. He's unimpressive, not important. He's not what we're looking for as a king, for sure. Notice how the Bible describes him, David. You catch that? He was ruddy. The word can mean red complexion. Had beautiful eyes, handsome in appearance. And when he came in, the Lord said, it is this one. And I'm sure the six brothers are going to say, what? What? But God said, it is this one. And so what is it that we leave here with? What is it that we take with us? There are three things I, I want to take from this text for a moment. The first one is this. It's okay to be average or below average. It's okay to be average or below average. We don't hear that much. It's always, you got to be above everyone. you got to be, but it's okay to be average. No one put much stock in David for sure that day. No one saw him as a king, unimpressive, unimportant, young. Shepherds were kind of the low end of the scale. Why? They, they were dirty, uh, messy. They weren't your social elite for sure. And so no one put much stock in him. He was just an average or below average guy. But the truth of the matter is, as I look around this room, we're all just average people. Or some, in a sense, maybe below average. But when you put our average in the hands of God, that's when God does something incredible. Listen to 1 Corinthians 127. But God has chosen, listen, the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And today, if you would say, man, I'm just an average Joe or an average Jane, congratulations. Because you are exactly who God is looking for. God is looking for the average person that he can use for his glory and honor. So don't go around and saying, God can't use me. I'm just average or a little below average. That's exactly who God uses in his kingdom work. Second, David was a nobody. Listen to what I'm saying. David was a nobody until the Spirit of God came upon him. Look with me in verse 13. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David. 
From that day forward, and Samuel rose and went to Ramah. It was when David received the Holy Spirit that came upon him that David then was able to do extraordinary things. It was then that David was able to defeat Goliath. David became a great warrior. David became a great king. And David wrote 73 of the 150 Psalms in which we love to read and love to meditate on. It was David that did all these things only after the Spirit of God came upon him. We find that in a Hebrew slave arose to be second in command in Egypt. And the Bible says of Joseph, the Lord was with him. And we find it in, in Exodus 30, uh, Deuter, excuse me, Exodus 39, 2 and 39, 21. And then we find that Gideon, 300 men, 300 men defeated 135 thousand Midianites. How? It says that the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. And then we read that Samson killed a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. And it says in Judges 15, 14, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. We find that God takes great delight in taking an average person or below average person and filling them with his Holy Spirit and doing extraordinary work with them. The third thing I want to point out to you, embrace the shepherd's field. Embrace the shepherd's field. How is it that David became such a great king. How is it that David could write such beautiful poetry that would just grip our heart even this many years later? It came from those cold nights and hot days out in the shepherd's field that prepared his heart, prepared his life to be a shepherd as a king over Israel. If you're going through some difficult days right now in your life, embrace it. Embrace the difficult days that you're in now. Embrace those times knowing that God is preparing your life for something in the future to come. It was in prison that Joseph was prepared to be the prince. It was in the wilderness that Moses was prepared to be a leader. It was in the brokenness that Peter was prepared to be a great voice in the early church. And it was in the shepherd's field that David was prepared to be a great leader that he was. Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purposes. And so what are the two takeaways that we leave here with? Why don't we decide with God's help, God's leading, that we would be people that wouldn't judge just based upon the outside. That we would be people that would have the eyes and the discernment of God that we would seek to see the heart of a person. Not their skin color and not their bank account not who their mom and dad was, their last name, where they were born, what side of the tracks, what side of the river. But we would begin to be people that would look at the heart of a person and judge them based upon the qualities of, of what we see in Galatians. When Galatians tells us the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, patience, kindness, that we would look to that to judge a life of an individual. But second, would you today take your ordinary life, just ordinary? You might not ever be a king. You might not ever rule. But if you would give it to the Lord and say, Lord, here's my ordinary life. Would you fill me? Use me? 
God can take your life and do extraordinary things to impact the kingdom of God. So with your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, I'm going to ask you, would you yield your heart, your life to the Lord? And would you be one here today that would say, Lord, here's my ordinary life. Here's my ordinary life. God, would you do something extraordinary with? Would you be willing to do that today? I'm saying, God, God, I, I want to be used by you. But for a long time, I, I've been using a crutch that I'm not special. I can't teach. I, I, I can't lead a big group. Well, today, what God is saying to you, I'm not looking for those with the most talent. I'm not looking for those with the most ability. I'm looking for the one that will yield his life and heart to me. Would you just cry out to God and say, God, will you use my life? You see, so many people that do so many great things for the Lord, they were nobodies. They were nobodies until the Lord's Spirit came upon them. See, if you're saved today, you already have the Holy Spirit, but have you yielded completely to the Lordship and the rulership of the Lord? just ordinary ah, you're who God is looking for today that one ordinary student that one ordinary father that one ordinary mom you today are exactly what God is looking for or a public decision that God has placed upon your heart this week. Maybe this week you've given your heart to Christ. You're listening to the radio. Maybe a friend, maybe somebody came and left a track and you read it. Man, it just arrested your life. Maybe for our students at Falls Creek that maybe you didn't make that decision earlier with Chase, but you need to come today publicly and say, you know what? I need to make that known. I don't need to wait. I need to make that known today. Maybe you need to come and make a decision public in which God has called you to. You do that today. Heavenly Father, we thank you today. We thank you that we're just ordinary people. We're just ordinary. Nothing special, nothing to write a book about, nothing to put on TV. But God, when we yield to you, these ordinary lives become extraordinary. That you do in us what we could never do on our own. You empower us to speak, to go, to comfort, to give, to love. So, Father, today we give you these ordinary lives. Knowing that we want to be used for your glory and honor to the fullest extent of the time that you've given us here on earth. So use us. And may you receive the glory. We thank you. 
What you look for is not what a man looks for. Not a natural man. We thank you that you look at the heart. You put your probe in our hearts. And that's what you see and that's what you desire. clean thoughts, pure motives, a heart that is set upon you. So take these ordinary lives of ours and use them to shake our community, this world, for your glory and honor. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.